This is Telling the Story, a podcast dedicated to exploring faith, spirituality, arts, and culture, hosted by Ninth Hour Theatre Company, located in Ottawa, Canada. Thank you for joining us for our first podcast series discussing C.S. Lewis's popular tale, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, the second of seven stories in the Chronicles of Narnia. This Christmas, Ninth Hour is presenting a live theatrical production of this beloved classic. For more information, visit our website, ninthhour.ca. That's number 9th-hour.ca. Or follow the links in the description. In this podcast series, we thought it would be interesting to discuss the lion, the witch, and the wardrobe in more detail to not only deepen and enrich yours and our understanding of this favorite story, but for the sheer pleasure of it. We also think you'll enjoy getting an insider's look at many of the artistic and production decisions that Ninth Hour Theatre Company makes in putting together this show. So, grab a drink and a favorite snack, maybe some Turkish delight, and settle in for a stimulating ride into the wardrobe and the world of theatre magic. Welcome to Telling the Story, Episode 6. The power of love. We're 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 dying to uh, dig deeper into that. Before though we do so, I just want to introduce my guests who are with me today. I'm joined again by my co-host George Dutch. George studied acting at Simon Fraser University in Vancouver with internationally renowned theater director Gundus Kalak during the 70s. Then joined his ensemble in Northern Australia for five years, where he taught a performance class in a university theater program during the 80s. George was director of the Drama Ministry at Dominion Chalmers United Church in Ottawa in the 2000s. He's been part of Ninth Hour since its beginning, doing business operations, dramaturgy, directing, acting, and helping with all other sorts of things as well. He played the beloved Mr. Beaver in our Ninth Hour's 2018 production of The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. And he's part of this year's production on the directing team, responsible for assisting with staging and dramaturgy. George thinks theater should investigate big ideas related to the role of culture in shaping everyday practices of living. Welcome again, George. Thanks for the introduction, and I'm happy to be here once again. Yes. And we're joined uh, by our, a brand new guest named Shauna Ackermans. Shauna is a multidisciplinary theater artist from the Ottawa area. She has a theater degree from Bishop's University, class of 2015, and is a bit of a workshop junkie, having completed three different Pochinko Clown workshops this year alone, including Baby Clown with John Turner and Jenny Hazelton. She is a stage manager, director, performer, and collaborator that works throughout the city. She sits on the boards of two companies, Skeleton Key and ITR Theatre. When she is not in the rehearsal hall, she works as a venue operations manager for an axe throwing company or is playing Dungeons and Dragons. Shauna is Ninth Hour Theatre Company's stage manager for this year's production of The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. And Shauna is part of the directing team, responsible for assisting with staging and puppetry. Welcome, Shauna. Yes, hi. Exciting to be here. Amazing. So yes, two guests joining me today. And like I said, we're here to talk about the power of love. All you need is love. <laughs> dun, 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 dun. All you need is love. <laughs> love. love. Love is all you need. <laughs> we just had to like wrap, finish that up. We're here. Uh, we're here in uh, Barebone Studios, surrounded by by records, and just you know, you can't help but conjure, think about these things. Beatles right? here, Beatles there. Beatles here, Beatles there, Beatles everywhere, and of course, uh, music. There's no shortage of examples of love being sung about in music. Uh, but before we dig into our themes today, Shauna, I want to know what. Is your history with the story, the line, the witch, the wardrobe? Of course, this is our sixth episode talking about the themes and ideas mm -hmm. about this exact story. Uh, we're happy to have you here on our final episode. But yeah, what's your history and background with the story with C.S. Lewis? You know, yeah, all of that. Yeah. So um, when I was in grade four, the line, the witch, and the wardrobe was our like class book. Um, and we so we read it in, in English class. So we did a whole a whole study of it, um, and that would have been like before the movies were made. Mm. So when the movies came out, I was like, I know this story. How exciting! Um, and then you know saw so then kind of rekindled the connection with the story the story there. 
so yeah, it's been a long, long, long road with uh, with the story for sure. I love The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe so much. Did you ever, did you like read it again after you like had to read it for school ever? Or? Uh, yeah, so I ha- actually, I have read the entire uh, Chronicles of Narnia at oh, least, wow. at least once. I've read The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe a handful of times, but wow. in the Chronicles, at least once, so. Wow. But I was young, so it's been a long time. Wow, so it definitely captured your imagination, yeah. obviously. Yeah. Did you have a do what do you remember do you have any memories of like, I don't know, like a moment in the in the book or the story or a character that you just really like drew your fascination? Yeah. Mr. Tumnus. Mr. Tumnus. Mr. Tumnus. I love Tumnus. Um yeah. And I think it's the relationship between Tumnus and Lucy that mm. always felt like so special. I think everybody wants to have this like um, you know, magical I don't want to call him imaginary because he's not imaginary, but mm. we would think that if Lucy told us that story, Mr. Tumnus was her imaginary friend. Right. 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 That's and what they kind of thought. It's yeah. the, her siblings. Yeah. 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 Everybody mm. wants to have that, have that friend that like whisks them away to the, to the magical land. Oh uh, yes. Yes. I think we'll get back to Mr. Tumnus later in our discussion too. Cause I think there's some, something there that's interesting as well about the, uh, even related to our topic tonight as well. And uh, so you're so you're stage managing this year's production, mm-hmm. and you're on the directing team, mm-hmm. helping with uh, staging, uh, blocking, character development, and puppetry. Puppetry. Do you want to tell us more about that? Yeah. Um, so Aslan is a puppet. Uh-huh. Uh, in our production, um, he takes three people to maneuver, so it is quite a feat to... Um, <laughs> no pun intended. No. Quite a, quite a feat, yeah. <laughs> He's got four of them. <laughs> <laughs> um, to, to make this puppet come alive. Um, but... Uh, so so beautiful and he's really quite adorable (laughs) he really is he has such a like um expressive face for a puppet i mean Mm. puppets puppets are all about their face and how you animate their keeping them alive right Mm. when they're when they're on stage so Mm. yeah that puppet i know was used in it's a 2014 uh, musical production of the same story, and it mm-hmm. was designed by Grace Solman, who um, I don't believe works in Ottawa anymore, but certainly uh, put a lot of effort and time into that puppet. You it know, shows. Wow. Huh? It shows. It's been in storage for nine years, huh? and now it's just back and it came <laughs> alive out, it again. It came out of storage and was like, yeah, here, this goes here. Like Everything wow. everything was fine. It, it survived being in storage so well. Wow. It's like, yeah, it, it, it brings a whole new meaning to the phrase Aslan's on the move when, the, you know, the puppet was on the move, on the move. to the rehearsal hall. You yeah. know, it's like, oh, here's Aslan. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it was so interesting. Do you remember, too, like, there's some reactions from some of the other cast when they first saw? The first, the first day that we had the puppet out one of the one of the children in the cast ran up to the front of Aslan and like grabbed his face and was like Aslan 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 oh. like into the into the puppet like oh. just could not contain their excitement oh. at seeing seeing this lion come come alive in the rehearsal hall wow yeah wow wow and we'll certainly dig in later in, in our conversation like how to how to make such a puppet come alive how do you convey love Mm -hmm. with a puppet and and things like that i think it's rather interesting to discuss Mm -hmm. you know that's what we're here to talk about of course and aslan represents a love a lot of love in in that in this story which is beautiful Mm -hmm. and so yeah speaking about love uh it came to my attention like recently that like my i remembered that c.s lewis wrote a book called the four loves um off after the fact that uh, in the greek language there's four words for love and uh, i i know ninth hour theater company at one point thought about and and sort of uh, planned even to to explore doing a um a dance theater piece exploring the four loves and george i i, I know uh, you know a little bit about um 
about the four loves and what Lewis meant about that and, and in which certain books he's written about it. And can you explain what the four loves are in the Greek language and what they represent? Yeah, the four loves uh, was a book that he wrote in 1960. So he wrote it after he wrote The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. Huh. And yeah, I think it's useful because it provides us a bit of a vocabulary to talk about love. Right. Because um, we use the term so broadly, oh. right? like the way we use snow, but the... The people in the north, they have like 126 names for snow because it's such an integral part of their environment and their livelihoods and all the rest of it. So they discriminate uh, between the different qualities of snow. And maybe we should discriminate a little between the different qualities of of love, which is what Lewis does in that book. So he starts off by explaining three natural loves. Um, the first one being, uh, uh, forgive me if I butcher the the uh, the Greek of this, but storge, which is um, affection, mm. the kind of affection that uh, a child feels for their parents or mm. that a parent feels for a child, mm. and then philia, which is friendship or fellowship. You know mm. the the uh, the feelings that you have, the love that you have for people that you have a, a shared or a common interest in, and you spend mm. a lot of time with. Like Philadelphia, the, the <laughs> city of brotherly love. <laughs> city of brotherly love. Yeah, that's good what one. they say. Yeah, that's the same root of the word. You're right. Mm. And uh, and then eros, of course, um, um, romantic love or um, erotic love or mm. sexual desire, um, mm. a very important part of the human experience. And he Mm. says that all of these loves are natural to all humanity. They're Mm. universal in every culture, you know, creed and race and all the rest of it. And then he uh, discriminates between another love that he calls agape, um, the love of God or charity would be a sort of loose um, um, charitable love interpretation Mm. of agape from the Greek. Um, And he considers that a very special uh, kind of love, and we can talk about that a little further into the uh, into our discussion, um, especially in the context of sacrificial love. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think, yeah, it's useful to discriminate between these different qualities of love because they show up in all human experience, of course, mm. and they're important to this story, the lion, the witch, and the wardrobe. Mm. And I would imagine that they intersect and interrelate in different ways and it's not necessarily true that you could only be exhibiting one form of those or uh, you know like sometimes you're doing two at the same time yeah love always exists in relationship right and we all have different kinds of relationships like with parents and with friends and with lovers and spouses and all the rest of it right Mm. and in some cases we have a vertical relationship with a god or a higher power Mm. whatever you want to call that yeah Mm. yeah it's interesting too right that like like in 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 English, you you have you like lo- you say the word love, but you 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 use it almost indiscriminately to refer to just almost everything. Because <laughs> all you need is love. yeah, like you know, <laughs> I love blue. I love uh, you know summer. I I love Turkish delight. I love my partner. I love like you you know we sort of use it interchangeably. Although we do have other words, don't we? Like you know, I like or I adore something or i enjoy something i guess could could kind of be in the same family maybe linguistically or at least sort of like you know you're using different words kind of like synonyms yeah like synonyms yeah yeah. and they and like but you don't you don't hear them often right like i adore turkish delight (laughs) and those four those four words are not really synonyms of each other they are meant to represent four separate like avenues mm. for love when you start talking about mm. like or adore they're still love mm. right you still use it in the same place you would use love but those agape and then you know those other ones they mm. they don't quite um they're not interchangeable mm. they they overlap in some places but mm. they they mean their own they stand on their own ground mm. and you almost like know it when you see it you're like oh that's some that's some philia going on there. That's some agape going on there, you know? You know, it's like, it's, yeah, because it's like, well, it's interesting, yeah. Yeah, because it's so, so agape love, right? I mean, I know I've, I heard one time it being referred to, you know, probably, you know, as, as godly love, you know, but of course that for many conjures up something not desirable. Cause so for many who don't believe in God or don't don't like God or have a, a, a bad relationship maybe in the past with religion or faith or God or the church or whatever there it's like well you can keep that that yeah that guy uh, you can keep your agape love because I don't want that because it maybe it was used in an abusive way right in a sort of in that sort of way but but I like how you you said George it's like actually more it's like charitable love like charity 
Um, and of course, you know, we have different things that come to our mind when we think of charity. Uh, I thought like, I thought about like charity, almost like, like a charitable act would be like to volunteer your time or to give your money and expect nothing in return. Like you're not getting compensation for either of those. You're not getting rewarded for either of those, at least not materially rewarded, you know, like probably intrinsically rewarded for sure. So I, I think about that, but that I think that's almost the starting point, isn't it? Like charity and, and the agape love probably goes so much deeper than just those examples I gave, right? Yeah. There's a quality of grace to it, right? That you're giving somebody unmerited favor or reward or undeserved, uh, you know, you're just giving it out of the goodness of your heart, out of love. Um, mm. um, yeah, with no conditions attached. Mm. Mm. It's truly a gift. Right. The gift of love. Yeah. And we called this, this episode, of course, the power of love. And so it's interesting to explore the, the power of agape love because it's perhaps it. I wonder. I, well, I don't know, but I wonder if it's one of the least explored in in contemporary music or like it's a harder one to, to sort of get into what do you think shauna yeah yeah i mean it's like a bigger it's like a bigger picture right if you write a song about your partner you right. have a direct relationship you have a direct thing that you are writing about but when you're talking about like a this larger community service this like you know, giving of of self to the to the greater the greater good, the greater being, or I liked the way you said it, George, the vertical relationship between you and and God or whatever your um your power your power or being is. Mm. You know, those are harder that that's less tangible. Mm. Right? Mm. And and the what that looks like for me is not what it's going to look like for your experience. Mm. So yeah. Mm-hmm. I, that's for sure. Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah, that's and, and people argue about it, right? But it's important. It's the experience is going to be different. You know? Yeah, that's so true. Yeah. So what? Um, what would you if if you could think about other than the Lion, the Witch, the Wardrobe? What are some examples of let Let's go with this sort of charitable love, sacrificial love, or transcendent love, perhaps, like some, uh, a love that's powerful, a love that changes, a love that mends, a love that alters someone's course in life. What are some examples in art or culture, contemporary or otherwise, or in theater or clowning or anything like that that, that maybe comes to mind uh, for either of you? Yeah. I think for me, I'm fascinated by the story of Dietrich Barnhofer, yeah. um, who was a, um, a, a, a priest or a minister uh, during World War II in Nazi Germany. And uh, he was actually involved in a plot to sacrifice Hitler. Like hmm. he, stood a, he took a firm stand against the evil of the Nazi regime. Um, and We brought him up at, on the last episode, didn't we? That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, he's, he's, he's a notable figure in, in modern Christianity um, mm-hmm. and a sort of modern ma- martyr um, mm-hmm. that died for his faith um, when facing uh, pure evil is, mm-hmm. and um, that plot failed um, but he took a very critical stance against the churches that were collaborating with uh, the Nazis mm-hmm. um, and Nazism stands for you know uh, it's an acronym for National Socialist Party like oh. it was it was it was um, uh, an atheistic organization Right, and it was uh, it tried to control the churches, and for the most part, the churches complied in that during Nazi Germany, mm. and collaborated uh, with the Nazis. Mm. And uh, Barnhofer was against that so much that he stood up and wrote letters to the public and gave public sermons against that evil. And he was arrested by the Nazis and thrown in jail, and uh, they tortured him to recant his position, and he wouldn't do so. And then two days before um, the war was declared over. Uh, they hung him in a German cell, hmm. uh, but he refused to um, uh, go along with them. He refused to recant. He stood his ground, his position, um, as as a martyr for somebody that believed in principles that were directly opposed to uh, the Nazi uh, regime and 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 the way that it operated and its principles. And, and paid the ultimate sacrifice, paid the ultimate price, which yeah. is death. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you can sacrifice your job, your reputation, yeah. and he did so willingly. Right. I mean, that's the part that I find so moving. Like Jeez. he chose to do that. Wow. Yeah. Wow. 
That's a great example. Yeah, they gave him an out, and he chose not to take it. He mm. chose, you know, he went to his, to the gallows willingly. Yeah, joyfully, even apparently. Oh wow, wow! Singing wow. and praying on his way to the noose. Wow. Wow. Jeez. That's wild. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, I and I I could think of some other examples too, and some some favorite stories of mine. Um, a lot of them are fictional, but still they get to me. Like yeah. there's like a. Uh, a beauty about the kind of love expressed in these stories. Uh, one, of course, is in Victor Hugo's um, Les Miserables. You love that story. I love that story. <laughs> I love that story, and so many people do. Um, and I, I could, I could, I, I would love the story even without music. Like I find just the story and the themes in the story are beautiful. Yeah. Well, it was just a story before it was a musical. Of course, of course, <laughs> yeah. it was a book. Yeah. And there's this one moment particularly. So Jean Valjean, if people don't know, stole a loaf of bread and got put to, into prison for a long time. And upon being released from prison, stays at the house of a bishop. And at the house of the bishop, he he decides to you know try to get a good start in life again. And well, decides to steal some silver and some silver st- candlesticks from from the bishop, and sneaks off in the middle of the night. And he gets caught by by the police and um, brought back to the bishop's house. You know, uh, are these yours? Did this man steal from you? And the bishop, in this instance, and most people have seen the the movie or the the stage version, we all we know this. The bishop is is just filled with grace and love. And instead of getting you know revenge or yeah, how dare you send him back to prison for another twenty years, um, he and and doesn't just say yes, oh yes, those are mine, and. Um, but but yes, he was just borrowing them. No, even further, gives the precious um, uh, silver to Jean Valjean to give him a fresh start in life, um, even though he could have went back to prison and he was caught. And so that moment just troubled Jean Valjean, of course, and there's a whole song and moment in it. And from then on, his life, well, the bishop commended his life to God. From now on, you are his, you are going to do good. And Jean Valjean, of course, wrestled with that. And there's a whole song where he's like struggling with who he is. Who am I? Who am I? You know. And he, of course, uh, concludes that um, that he's now going to live his life for God, and he's going to be a man of of justice, forgiveness, redemption, sacrificial love. And he does uh, pay the ultimate price in the end as well, sacrificing for Cassette and sacrificing for Marius, who's not even his own child. And, of course, Marius and Cassette get to live happily ever after, but because of Jean Valjean's sacrifice. Uh, and he sacrifices for, you know, for other people around him. He becomes a good man. And, you know, and it's just like, oh, it's just one of these stories that I love. What about you, Sean? Do you have one? Or, I mean, oh, I could go on, you know? You no, know, no, what's, what's funny is I'm listening, I'm listening to the two of you tell your stories, and I, I have this, like, Rolodex going in the back of my mind. So I'm, like, trying to listen, I'm trying to flip through all the stories in my mind as well of, like, what which one can I say? And the thing that keeps, like, coming back up to the surface, I was like, you can't say that one, you can't say that one, um, is, <laughs> is uh, the, like, final moment of Lord of the Rings, where they finally carry the ring up the up the mountain and he I uh, you know finally carries Frodo and they finally they finally conclude their their mm. journey and that that moment of friendship and that like you know a sacrificing of self and of body oh, yeah. in that in that in that moment and that was the thing that kept playing in my in my mind was totally. was that was that that final that final scene. No, I'm glad you brought that up. I mean, J.R. Tolkien and 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 C.S. Lewis were friends, were contemporaries, yeah. and wrote you know along you know wrote together and criticized each other's work. And you're totally right. Like Lord of the Rings is filled with examples of sacrifice, mm-hmm. and it, it, that's a great one actually. I think that's so true. Uh, yes. So uh, so in the line in which in the wardrobe. Uh, you were bringing up um, Mr. Tumnus earlier, Shauna, mm. and uh, I was thinking too. Like originally, of course, he like works for the Queen, right? For the for the White Witch, but then he does make a sacrifice to save Lucy, which yes. I find interesting, and yes. maybe that's why he's loved. Well, the the whole moment of like, well, I have to take Lucy to to the Queen, and that deciding to turn on that on that decision changes like the whole. It, you know that's like the inciting incident in that in that moment like it would completely change the whole 
the whole course and ultimately for Tumnus it changed the outcome of his life there he gets turned to stone <laughs> yeah yeah he gets to- <laughs> Yes, we don't. We don't mean to laugh, but it's 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 a, it's just we we just can't help but uh, you know it's 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 shocking. It's 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 unfortunate. The the, the end, right? From his mm-hmm. yeah, the sacrificial love. I mean, it turns out well for him in the end, in of the course. End. But yeah, but you're right. He pays the ultimate sacrifice. And turning, he, you know, he knew that when he went against the the witch's orders, he knew something like that was going to happen if he didn't carry out her her orders and he chose he chose different. Mm. Right? Mm-hmm. So he he made that decision to not turn Lucy in with full understanding of what the repercussions of that of that would be. Mm. And mm. did it anyway. And did it anyway. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, so George, what do you think are some other examples in the line in which the wardrobe of agape. Well, I think we, we have the big example of Aslan being sacrificed at the stone table. Um, is an analogy towards the crucifixion s- seen in the, in, the, in the Christian story, in Christ's story. Um, and Aslan is, um, is killed uh, at the stone table, uh, which has all kinds of you know, uh, uh, symbolism to it, mm. uh, by the witch. And uh, I think people are interested in interested in hearing you know how we might stage that with a big eight foot puppet on the stage <laughs> at a stone table mm. which isn't actually stone of course because we're using the theater magic of right. illusion mm-hmm. uh, we have painted set pieces that look like stone of course and um, and getting this lion uh, sacrificed at this stone table um, in a way that's dramatic and mm. that uh, moves the story forward and helps people feel the meaning of sacrificial love mm. Mm. And how do we, how do you get them, like, like what you're thinking about feeling, feeling the sacrificial love of a puppet, a non-human, you know, uh, character on stage? Like, you know, have you seen that done before, Shauna? Like, yeah. Oh, a puppet being, like, sacrificed on stage? N- no. I've seen puppets have a f- have feelings. Have love and feelings, and have yeah. feelings, for sure. Right. Killing a puppet, maybe not. <laughs> maybe not, right, yeah. Um, yeah, it's, an, it's interesting because the the face of the of the puppet is so expressive, even though its face doesn't move, right? It can't, like, raise its eyebrows and, like, you know, wobble its mouth and move its legs and stuff. But, you know, it doesn't have the same kind of, like, range of emotional expression as a human, as a human would. But there's something so... Um, like it's animated right right and so even though it's not physically moving the features of its face it still has this like life breathed right. into it by the by the puppeteers and the way that they move together and um you know they make that magic together by bringing it alive mm. wow. yeah i think it's also important to set the context you know why aslan is is being sacrificed in terms of the story which involves four children the pevensey children that have been sent away from London during the Blitzkrieg in World War II to the safety of yeah. a country home, and they discover this wardrobe. They yeah. go through the wardrobe. They enter this magical, fantastical world called Narnia, and they meet characters there. And that world, where it's always winter and never Christmas, is ruled by this white witch, this tyrannical figure um, that controls everybody in Narnia, who are waiting for deliverance from this tyranny um, by the appearance of Aslan. Um, and Aslan comes, and of course, love is all about relationship, as I said earlier. And he established a relationship with these four kids, different relationships with each one of them. Mm. Um, and of course, we see him come alive, or we come to um, see him as a as a living figure through the eyes of the children mm-hmm. and the other characters um, in Narnia who are waiting for him um, to appear. They've got great faith that he will appear, and they're anticipating his appearance with tremendous hope and a lot of the story involves the fact that there's been a prophecy in Narnia for a hundred years that when human children, four human children appear, then um, the white witch will be defeated. So the white witch knows this prophecy and it doesn't want it to happen and of course threatens the children and is going to kill one of them, specifically Edmund, and Aslan steps in to save Edmund. Hmm. And uh, there's a um, a, a conversation, a dialogue between him and the witch that we're not privy to hmm. that's organized around this deep magic, this this concept of deep magic to save Edmund's life hmm. in exchange for Aslan's life. And that's how he ends up 
on the stone table mm -hmm. under the knife of the white witch. So have you got any ideas as the puppeteer manager and stage manager how that's going to be staged at this point? Oh, I do, I do have a couple of ideas for it, for sure. I mean, it's, we were talking about like it's three people in a giant puppet, right? But, um, you know, the, they're not going to all be able to fit on the stone on the stone table, but his head will. Mm. Oh. And, and, you know, there is like, you know, the sadness of seeing the puppeteers leave yeah. the puppet. Mm would be like quite theatrical quite a thing yeah right to literally see that this puppet that we've just spent the whole you know first act of the show mm -hmm. bringing to life and animating him and watching these three mm -hmm. puppeteers move together mm -hmm. and breathe together to bring this thing alive mm -hmm. to literally then leave him on the stone table lifeless and, and lifeless and yeah. walk away from while him. the witch and her allies are jumping for joy yeah. around him delighting in the evil yeah. that has transpired yeah. that they get to kill this great figure aslan yeah. yeah and some of the words you used too just made me think too uh uh i mean you used like the term the words animated bring to life and it's just interesting this like co-creative spirit that artists can have in the world to bring things to life, to create things. You know, the, the puppet designer created the puppet. The actors, the, the, the puppeteers bring it to life. They animate it, right? And then and then we cease to animate it. We cease to bring it to yeah. to life. Is it and that's that maybe that's symbolic of the death, right? In that sense. And doing that intentionally at that time mm. can be very powerful. I think you're right, yeah. Speaking of powerful, well, maybe not, but uh, the, <laughs> witch, <laughs> the, the witch's temptation uh, to Edmund, of course, which starts the whole thing, is Turkish delight. And, well, we're in the company of Nigel, who spoke on our last episode about Turkish delight because he grew up eating some Turkish delight. So we are surprised and delighted to come in today and have some Turkish delight right there in front of us on the coffee table. And we're going to uh, take a break and sample some of it and we'll let you know uh, what we think after the break. Okay, we'll be right back. <laughs> Cheers. You are listening to Telling the Story, a podcast by Ninth Hour Theatre Company dedicated to exploring faith, spirituality, arts, and culture. Special gratitude goes out to Nigel Harris of Bare Bones Studio. For more information, go to barebonesstudio.godaddysites.com. That's Bare Bones Studio. It's with great joy that we record this podcast in an intimate setting where genuine conversation can take place. Thank you to Bare Bones Studio. And now, back to the podcast. Well, I just inhaled a Turkish delight by <laughs> Fries, and it was quite good. I've had Turkish delight before. But this was the best, and it yeah. was chocolate covered. What do you think, Shauna? I didn't think I liked Turkish Delight, and I liked this. So <laughs> I'm so surprised. <laughs> and this is what Nigel grew up with. Like this is the exact it's packaging he said too. And it's much better. Wow. Much better. Yeah. So that was a good treat. Thanks, Nigel. Thank you, Nigel. Appreciated that. So where were we? We were talking about. Uh, uh, sacrificial love, the power of love, and we were talking about different examples. Even on our break, while we were uh, chowing down on some Turkish delight, we were talking about some other real life examples of of of, of love that that ends in martyrdom or ends in death. And I think, and we were talking about how, I mean, the person isn't necessarily expecting that end. And I think it's interesting, Aslan in the story of Lion, Witch, the Wardrobe, uh, or in the Jesus story, is expecting the end being death. But then there's lots of examples of real life people that are choosing love, choosing uh, agape, charitable love, choosing to uh, pursue peace even in war, choosing to pursue justice and truth even in even in civil civil disobedience, and they don't expect the end to, to come by death, although perhaps they're quite prepared for that possible outcome. 
you know, and what and we talked about uh, some different examples of that. I mean, Bonhoeffer, you already talked about George, probably. Uh, he might have not expected it to end the way it did. Um, you know, and there's lots of other examples. Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated. He might he, he probably didn't expect that to be the end. But we were just saying on the break that sometimes that can make the cause more meaningful, more, I mean, more uh, deeper and people are, are more affected by it, more altered by it. Um, and it, it's interesting about that. Uh, and then we also talked about uh, about transactional love, that that sometimes you love without expecting any love back. And sometimes that's the richest. But yeah, did you have anything to add to to that at all, like about those themes. Yeah, I, I would like to add something. Uh, Lewis says that the natural loves the affection um, and the um, uh, friendship and the erotic love. Those are all natural or human loves that get distorted or tainted or um, abused when they're not surrendered to the agape love. And uh, we can all think of examples in our lives where um, we've been deficient in love ourselves or we've wanted love so much and when we don't get it we get hurt like anybody that's been in therapy or anybody that's spent time with people that have been in a lot of therapy they talk about how their needs for love weren't met either you know affection in the family or not having friends or not being able to find a partner or being wounded by by a, a, a partner or whatever the case might be and mm. Lewis's point is mm. that to love it all in any of those natural loves is to be vulnerable, is mm. to take a risk. That's mm. what it means to be human. Yeah. And to take a risk and be vulnerable means you're going to be hurt because that's just the way humanity is. You know, we're mm. all flawed and we, we end up hurting each other. Mm. Um, and you have to take that risk if you want to love at any level. Um, and the key then is to surrender that love to the agape love, the higher love, rather than the, the horizontal love, you're going to feel pain. That's inevitable if you want love or you, you mm. want to be loved and you want to give love to other people, that's inevitable. You're going to experience pain. Mm. And the way that pain can be healed is if you surrender it to the agape love. Mm. And it's interesting because the Greek word for surrender means to take off the mask. Oh. To stop being the hit hypocrite, to, to give up your ego. And does it hypocrite that. mean actor? It, well, it, that's, a, that's, what, that, that's one <laughs> yeah. of the interpretations yeah. of, of the Greek word for hypocrite. That's right. So we're all sort of acting these roles of you know giving love and wanting love and receiving mm -hmm. love. But it's tainted. It's, mm -hmm. it's corrupted <laughs> by um, the distortions of, of life, mm. um, whether that's power or wealth or, mm. or, or, or um, whatever the case might be. Mm. Uh, so surrendering that love, taking off the mask, and in a sense being naked before God or before that higher power is the key to being healed from that wound. Um, because so much of love is wrapped up in ego, right? Mm -hmm. It's what we want. And, uh, and, and his, Lewis's point is that it's greater satisfaction. You're going to live a more, you're going to have more vitality in your life by loving others hmm. than by being loved. Of course, we all fascinated with love. We all want to be loved. We want, all, want the joy of love. We all want to be known by somebody else really fully and all that. Um, of course. Hmm. But giving your love willingly to other people without expecting without and, anything and, and giving love to people that you wouldn't otherwise love with those three natural loves right. mm -hmm. and doing or might that, not have the capacity to love you in that, turn that's right yeah um th that is even more uh, satisfying and more humane in his view mm. um and more difficult uh, mm. because you're doing it by choice mm. in the same way that god made a choice he says to love humanity and all the pain then Humanity constantly rejecting God, right? Mm. Constantly abusing His love. Mm. That He, in a sense, sent His own Son into the world to be to suffer the worst torture, the worst pain that humanity could imagine. So even God feels that pain. And the only healing can come through experiencing that pain mm. and coming out on the other side of it with the choice, the willingness to love the people that have given you that pain. Ooh. Ooh. Like for well, and that's touching on that that word, right? Forgiveness, right? But 
but it but it seems like a, it's cheaply used and thrown out there a lot. And like, oh, you should forgive. You got to forgive. Move on. Forgive. But I like your deeper analogy. It's not mine. It's C.S. Lewis. Yeah, <laughs> right? Yeah, well, there you go. Like, yeah. Yeah. yeah, like that. that yeah, I, lo- I love that. And, and, and even as you're speaking, it struck me too that like even with the deep n- magic of Narnia, we talked in earlier episodes about that being love, capital L, like an expressive, creative force. In fact, so creative that it sung Narnia into being. Aslan sung Narnia into being, which is a creative activity. But even as you were speaking, it struck me too that like love, that kind of love, that powerful love, like even if there's no love present, like there's no there's no absence of love like love is like a creative force like you choose to love and add more love into the relationship into the community into the family into the society into the culture like and if you don't less love will be in there like you don't just wait around hoping to find love and discover it you can actually generate love it's a creative act which is an interesting concept like in a loveless relationship one could add love to it interestingly Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's one of his key points is that we don't wait around trying to find love, is that we go out and be loving. We become love. Mm. We love others rather than looking for it and finding it. We choose, we, we make a choice to go out and love others. Mm. Mm. To mm. be love. Right, right. Yeah, and, and there's certainly lots of and of course we that experience. Yeah. And if you do that, you're going to get hurt probably, right? Yes. And then we, we build up all these defensive armors, these defensive mechanisms, so that we don't get hurt again. Right. Because right? who, wants, who wants pain? Yeah. Right? Mm-hmm. yeah, you run away from it. Right. Yeah. Yeah, in fact, some of the times I felt probably most loved was in service of others that I didn't expect any love from i didn't expect anything back from you're there for them you're there to make their life a little easier to to assist in some small way in their flourishing and the reward was always surprising because the reward was always like you end up feeling loved too just by being there even though you had no intention of you weren't going there looking for that you were actually wanting to give something into the world into the community or whatever, yeah, but yes, and back to our our storyline, the witch in the wardrobe, where we have Aslan, right? You know, choosing, I guess choosing, but we've we've also talked about the fact that the law demands a sacrifice, uh, and we were speaking about how Edmund was supposed to be the one, right, that got killed for being a traitor. Being a traitor, yeah. Traitor, the traitor has to die. The traitor has to die. And so somehow they worked out that, like the witch and Aslan, I guess, worked out that Aslan will take his place, which probably made the witch happier. Happier, Fine. I'll kill you then. Great, you know. Yeah, there's like these layers of like deep magic and deep magic of like, because Aslan and the witch have this conversation that we don't know the details of right Aslan just comes back and says I'm taking Edmund's place but then Aslan also knows that there's some other deep magic that because he's not the traitor dying at the table that he's not he you know he is going to come back after this he has to go through that process and he has to go through that act but he knows that the, the this this magic of the stone table will protect him. So there's sort of this like double mm. layer of like he knows that she knows, but she doesn't know that he oh. knows <laughs> going like going on. Right. She doesn't know that even deeper magic. I love how you put that. Because she wouldn't have taken yeah. him up on the deal. Right. <laughs> if she knew he was just gonna come back. Right. <laughs> like what a waste of energy. What a and waste time. of everybody's time that yes. would have been. Yes. That's so true. That's so true. That's so true. Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, that uh that and that and that too, like she yeah, you're right. Like uh, I love how you put that, like that he's not the traitor. Yeah. So there's a there's a sacrifice here. He doesn't deserve to die. He de- yeah. He didn't do anything wrong. And he's wrong. protected. He's yeah. protected by taking up that trade the place of the traitor because he wasn't the traitor. So mm-hmm. he's like protected by that whatever that deep magic, whatever mm-hmm. these contracts are that are flying around, he's right. protected by that. Right. 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 And what and and so he dies and spoiler alert, you know, he he comes back from from death. And 
what does that do? What's the power in this act, would you say, George? Well, I think the first thing about the deep magic is he surrenders to the deep magic, which remains a mystery mm. to uh, the characters in the story and to us. Yeah. You know, how can he come back from the dead? There's something about this deep magic that he surrenders himself to, not knowing what the outcome is going to be. And we don't either. Um, and when he does come back, of course, he encounters uh, the, the two sisters. Um, you know, how did you... What are you doing here? Right. You know? Is this, are you a ghost? Yeah. Is, you you know, a ghost? yeah. A, yeah. Um, and that's when the process of healing of Narnia begins, right? With the fulfillment of the prophecy and the replacement of the witch and her allies and all the evil that they have brought and the tyranny they've brought to Narnia that gets replaced. Uh, but there's more pain to follow because it doesn't get replaced magically. They go through a battle, through a war. Yeah. Um, mm. So there's more pain um, in the healing process. And that is, to me, another great mystery, you know, mm. that, that that love is generated through pain. Mm. And that it's unavoidable. And if you try to avoid the pain, then you're not going to get the love at the end, mm. this great love at the end. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Avoiding the pain doesn't work. They have to go through this battle. Yeah. There's a cost There's to a it cost. all. There's a cost. It seems weighty. Like, it's not just a, oh, well, he'll die in your place, and that's that. Like, there's there's so much more to it, you know? Uh, like you said, there's a battle. Like, yeah, yeah, you'd, th- you'd like it to be over. Like, he roasted him dead. Great. You know? But then they go into this huge battle. Yeah, because the witch is still there. Because she's still there. Just because Aslan came back doesn't mean that, like, it makes everything else Eagle go away. Eagle hasn't disappeared. Yeah. It's still there. Yeah. Yeah. So I wonder if the act of the the sacrificial death, and in this case the the rising from the dead, I wonder if the power of I mean we were talking earlier about martyrdom, and it's certainly unintentional martyrdom. Like you didn't know you were going to die in that cause, like Bonhoeffer or whatever. But maybe you thought you might, but you weren't sure. You weren't. You were certain. willing to take the risk. You're willing to yeah. take the risk and accept whatever comes. And so maybe that type of Sacrifice just bestows upon everyone such such confidence, such courage, inspiration, such inspiration, and maybe that's the power in a sacrifice of, uh, of love or uh, someone uh, acting in a manner that what do they, well, what do they get out of it? They just seemed they just seemed so um, motivated here to to correct something in the world. Yeah, and it, it inspires hope and faith, right? Like the mm. death isn't the end. Yeah, it's not over. Mm. Yeah. At death. Right. Right. There's a reason to get up and to have hope and to have faith that things can be better. The world can be a better place. Right. It doesn't happen magically in that sense. You still have to go through the pain. We have to fight this war. People are going to die. Right. People got injured. (laughs) Right. Right? Yeah, there's Uh, still work. There's still work work to to be done. There's still work to do, like beyond Aslan coming back. right? Right. Because he also takes, like, quite a humiliation before his death as well, right? It's not just, like, stab him and he's, he's dead. Mm-hmm. Like, it's not it's not quick. The witch mm-hmm. relishes in having Aslan in this position, right? Mm-hmm. They muzzle him. They tie him up. They cut his mane off. Like, there's all these things that are... call them names, right? call them names, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. There's all these, like, steps to it, right? She relishes in that action, and it's not just... Like let's get it over with as quick as possible to make sure it's we get the job done. It's it's right. about the there's enjoyment in it for her as well. Yes, that's yeah. you're right. There's enjoyment in the and humiliation. Yeah, that's so true. I huh? like that makes it so much more like costly. You know, um, what do you guys? Oh, and I'm sure that's quite the moment in in the play where shit, the the people who thought he was dead suddenly realize he's not now for the yeah. for the bad guys they're gonna be shocked like totally. didn't we just kill him and for the good guys they're gonna be shocked suddenly full of like you said full of hope and faith and joy and the prophecy and all the stuff so that's that should be quite the moment in the in the play I would imagine such a revelation that no one should see coming right well, if they don't know the story. If they don't know the story, that's right, that's right, that's right. And I guess it's the directing team's job to make that a beautiful moment with the cast, you know? I so. think even people who know the story can still be surprised by that moment, right? Um, yes. Because, because just because you know what's going to happen doesn't mean that it's not heart-wrenching or that there's not, there's not magic. Right. Um, there's not magic in that. 
and I love what you said earlier too, Shauna. You you spoke so you know so wonderfully about the puppet, and 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 I think people will, and especially kids will. How can you not right like the puppet even even more than a human a human playing that role? Yeah. And for that puppet to come back, I, I mean, I just I just almost want to well up right now just thinking about the puppet making a grand entrance again after after that horrible scene of its death. And it isn't the puppet we feel for, because the puppet is, of course, uh, a manufactured thing. It's what the puppet represents, and it's the story and the, and all that, right? Like, yeah. it's like, oh, you know, like, gives me just sort of chills. The puppet's a big piece. Yes, like, yes. You know, it's going to be quite, quite a feat to see it alive on, on stage. Yeah, no, for sure. And, and and to point out, too, as you point out, there's three actors in it, and then there's a fourth actor voicing it. So it's like four actors, four actors working yeah. together, in a sense, to, yeah. to tell that. Jeez, wow. And uh, I wanted to ask you guys, though, your opinion about whether or not, I mean, the, do the children make sacrifice? Do they exhibit charitable love in the story? Is that something Lewis is also wanting to communicate and say? I mean, it's, you know, they're being put to the country, away from their parents, uh, and then they're asked to fight a battle in a, in a world that they're not from. I mean, I guess they could have just not bothered and went home. That's right. They chose to take the risk as well. Um, so, obviously, they were inspired by some of the figures in Narnia, especially Aslan. I think that's the thing about sacrificial love, is it does inspire us to do things we wouldn't naturally do mm-hmm. um, that we will take a risk for the sake of love for the sake of making the world a better place for expanding the territory of love mm-hmm. um, throughout Narnia right. um, and throughout the world so do they make a direct sacrifice well they certainly don't die they don't even get injured in in this in this story but they I, I don't fight, know about the other uh, they stories fight in for the narnians of which they, fight, they are not narnians. right they fight on behalf of narnians mm-hmm. yeah they join the, uh, the the allies of aslan um and that's a choice so they do take that risk is it because they see the suffering of the narnians like we have to fight we have to like what's their motivation well i think it all starts from lucy feeling at fault because tumness is missing Right, like we go all the way back to the very beginning when Lucy brings her siblings into Narnia with her, and Tumnus is Tumnus is missing, right. and they can't they find the handkerchief, but like nothing, and he's not there. Right, and Lucy feels like she has some kind of she. It's her fault. That she t- says that you're yeah, right. Yeah, it's that, all my fault. It's that, all my fault. That yeah. Tumnus is missing, and she has to she has to do something mm. about it. So it all starts with this. Like it, I won't let something my actions affect somebody else like this and i'm going to make it right and then that sort of sets the snowball of the kids being in narnia and getting um you know whisked away into this into this magical into the magical land right good point yeah Yeah. i think there's a lot to that plus they make a choice to surrender themselves to aslan remember aslan appears and they get this feeling for aslan yeah and they surrender those feelings to aslan um except edmund Hmm. He makes a choice not to. Hmm. And, of course, that uh, propels the story in a different direction uh, when he becomes an ally of, of the uh, witch. And hmm. the children want to rescue him from that. Yeah. And it hmm. gives, helps give them courage to do that, to yeah. take a risk and rescue their brother, hmm. who hasn't been very nice to them up to this point. Right? Hmm. No. Hasn't been very loving no. or kind no. or right. patient with them. Right? No. right. And they do take him back and they do love him again. Like... And at what well, Aslan makes it clear, like, you know, we're not going to talk about this again. He's your, you know, brother taken back, right? There's like yeah. a beautiful little scene. Yeah, so that, that natural love that was distorted by the queen uh, through Edmund um, is redeemed. Mm. And they're restored by the power of uh, the agape love yeah. represented by Aslan. Mm. That power of transformation, of the power of agape love to transform the mm. deficiencies of natural love into something higher, something more powerful. Wow! Yeah, yeah. to be dissatisfied, right? But to the but but to then uh, do something about it, to manifest something, to create something, to you know, to uh, off uh, what uh, put love into the world, you know, to 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 choose to do so against. 
what's natural uh, against uh, wanting vengeance, against wanting your uh, enemy to hurt, you the person that doesn't love you enough to also know what it's like to not be loved and all these things, right? Yeah. Um, and then, and then, did, did, uh, what was I going to ask about the um, one last thing about the kids? Uh, oh, it's stri- I know. I was going to say it strikes me. The story strikes me interest like that. The kids are so respectable, you know. Uh, you know, other than Edmund, but then he becomes quite respectable. Like so, especially in you know, in Act Two, they're quite respectable and courageous, quite frankly. And it, I, I, I wonder if like we we. We don't inspire kids anymore to be courageous as much, you know, or something. Or I wonder. I wonder if that's why the story is so good. It's that it inspires courage among kids. And kids, of course, in contemporary society, have to face all sorts of challenges. It might not be war, but it might be war. But it also might be uh, uh, d- divorce. It might be the loss of a family member. It might be uh, getting bullied at school, getting bullied online. And um, how much kids today, I'm sure, need inspiration, right? Uh, and yeah. that powerful love that would give them courage to to go against, to uh, stand against these things, and 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 pers- per, um, you know persevere through these things, you know. Um, and of course, I know we like all all three of us. We love working with children. It's always a delight to see them to see them grow and to see them be challenged to see them enjoy themselves and um i know sean i'll ask you like just ending ending on children and just uh, how you know the sacredness of children and power of love um and the power of, of of children loving as well right like i know you got to meet with uh some of the kids in the cast and and recently and some of their what were the some of what was their some of their the things they enjoyed the most about being part of the production so far oh uh, almost i think all of them actually said that one of their favorite things were, were the people People. Um, and making connections and being in community and also um interact like making those connections with a wide range of ages because we have you know our youngest is like 10 yeah. and then you know we have like adults yeah you know all through all kinds of ages and all kinds of different life stages and the kids are loving that everybody is showing up to do this thing together and that they're a part of it um that they're being included that they're being asked questions that they're being challenged and getting to see you know all of this um you know a variety of life experiences yeah yeah that's a beautiful it thing. It really is beautiful. Yeah, yeah. it's a real, uh, real uh, uh, honor, isn't it, to 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 work with kids and to have kids in a in a, in a production and and in a production a story like this, right? Too, like, boy, does it give it some life. The boy, does it give it that sort of charm that that it's it's what's needed, you know? You'd yeah. say, yeah, yeah. Wow. Well. Um, I would like to just offer the rest uh, for you guys to maybe end off finishing off with some final thoughts about the power of love, sacrificial love, um, any examples you wanted to share, just your sort of last thoughts on the topic. Uh, It could be related uh, to the show itself, the story itself, or unrelated. Uh, Yeah, is there anything you want to conclude with? Uh, yeah, so um, one thing that kept coming up for me as we're talking through all the different, all these different things, you're smirking because you know what I'm going to say, <laughs> <laughs> is, is clown. Because there's so many, there's so many things that um, come up with love in in relation to clown. Shauna loves the art of clowning. Can you tell? I yes. <laughs> yes. Many people don't know it's an art. But uh, it's a, no, and it, you, you know, know it's because you know people um you know there's a lot of different perceptions around around clown and and obviously there's like people have their people have their opinions but there is like a type of performance that is getting up in in clown and it is an act of love to get up in clown because it is like the most vulnerable someone can be on on stage because the clown mm. is everything at once and mm. you know loves and does everything so deeply mm. that um 
you're just watching that person go through whatever like whatever that is mm. while they're while they're on on stage and like authenticity yeah, yeah. like tr- and in true real um vulnerability mm. um as well and then um you know there's this clowns have this history from sort of like before this like modern era of lecoq and pachinko clown of you know being the ones that always said the truth and like going for Mm. the like you know making fun of the making fun of the king and making fun of the queen and they were the only ones who could who could say those things and they filled they filled that role right everybody was thinking it and the only person who could get away with saying it Ah. was 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 the clown right Uh. and they served that like very specific part Mm. um not all of them lived. Ah, see, right? that's interesting. So there's re- there's there's reputational sacrifice and and even light. Like you you meant you went too far, maybe saying the truth. Yeah. Or yeah. or you know, King Henry didn't like what you said, so off with his head. Yeah. That's yeah. interesting. Yeah. Wow. And yeah. That, I mean, you know, those are clowns. Like that's hundreds of years ago. We're talking about like that's not happening to clowns today. But <laughs> <laughs> they just get canceled today. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Leave a bad leave a bad review on their friend show, and now yeah. no one will go and see it. Yeah, would you? I mean, this is a random tangent question. Are comedians an extension of clowning, like modern day contemporary extensions of of the court jester of clowns? I I think it depends on the comedian because I don't think all comedians are truly honest. Okay, fair, and that, fair enough. And Good that answer. comedy stand, especially stand up comedy, is a is a fabrication, hmm. right? right? And and they're telling stories and they're and they're being present, but right. there there's something fabricated about uh, that that doesn't quite like live in the in the, they're adjacent uh, for sure. So it depends on the comedian because and but the key was vulnerability, right? Authenticity yeah. Yeah. and an offering of some sort. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah they all don't mock the king either. Right. The, 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 the clown or the court jester's role was to mock the king. Yes. To bring to humble them, to to get them to acknowledge some humility. Yes. Right? That they're human too. Yeah. Oh. They're not really different or above the regular pe- the other the people that they were governing. they were gods, right? right. They right. were they were divinely chosen right. to be to be leaders yeah. and the and the the court jester was like, mm, I don't think so. Oh. <laughs> Just another human being. Yeah. Remember. Yeah. <laughs> You're going to die too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There was a, there was a Catholic saint. It might've been a CC. I'm not sure that was known as like the Jean Gleur de Dieu, like the, 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 the fool of God, the clown of God. Like I forget if it's St. Francis of CC. I, I could stand corrected, but he would stand on his head and he would just, I don't know. He would I do think, some interesting right. things. Yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. It's just fine. It kind of fascinating. Like, you know, you're combining, like spirituality and and you know real life sort of like living sacrificially you know as 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 a saint I guess and uh, but then also like being in this realm of being a clown and yeah. abs- absurd and and exposing and showing people things about themselves and about God I guess yeah yeah. No, I'm so glad you brought that up, Sean. It's so interesting. Like, and it's so so interesting. There's so much untapped like potential to communicate beauty and truth through clowning. I think that I'd love to explore further. And, yeah. You know. Yeah. And what about you, George? Do you have any last things to add to the conversation? Yeah, my last words would be this: uh, Love is patient. Love is kind. Um, it does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It is not rude. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices in the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. Hmm. Wow. That's that's well said. Good to end on that one. And I, I'll just end on one story that moved me. Uh, uh, maybe five or six or seven years ago doing some theater workshops about um, revenge, like vengeance. Mm-hmm. We were exploring the, the principle of vengeance and we were looking for real life stories that were not that. So that so there's lots of examples in, in history and in contemporary news and in real life 
that where people are motivated by revenge of, of, of the others feeling the pain that they felt and if not doubly so uh, and, and paying the cost and you'll you'll feel what I'm feeling too and we talked about some of these things earlier in the in, or earlier in the discussion about relationships and pain right and it's it haunted me and struck me because it was an audio clip of of two women one was the mother of someone who died in 9-11 in one of the Twin Towers in New York City. And the other woman was the mother of one of the uh, people that committed that atrocity. And they became friends. One of the plane hijackers. One of the hijackers, yeah. And they became friends through post that event. And they they worked at that, and it was quite the story that inspired the heck out of me. I remember being very moved because it's unexpected, it's un it's it's extraordinary. It is the kind of thing that inspires you, that moves you to make the world a better place. That you want to make the world a better place. And I'll always remember the haunting words she said about you know this thing happened to us as. As, as America, this was the woman whose son died in in the 9/11 um, event, and she said, "Yeah, we had the we had the world's attention. Everyone felt for us. We had the compassion of the world on our side, and we blew it." Those were her final words. In that, like her view was that they blew it. In that, they went and got. You know, went to war, went and got revenge, went and wanted to uh, make people pay for that. So this um, this workshop, we we called it "Someone's Got to Pay," right? And it was all about just this idea that humans need someone to pay. We need vengeance. You hurt me, so I'm going to hurt yes, you. Yes, and we oh. all do. But this example was like almost like I was like very encouraged by it because yeah. you just don't hear enough of that right? i've never heard this story before you've never talked about this workshop before and i'm like i like literally my, my jaw's on the floor listening you, yeah. listening to this like <laughs> it was haunting and it, and, it, and it, i don't think it needs to be only in that in the case of 9 11 but yeah, it's, it's yeah. inspiring and i'd love to know what became of those two friends those two women but boy did that ever shine a light on on things for wow. me yeah wow right wow. i mean just wow right wow. like and the sacrifice there because you're you are sacrificing uh getting revenge yeah. you are sacrificing perhaps what is perhaps what is justice in fact you're you're exhibiting and on top of it to form a friendship is almost just insane like i wouldn't expect that yeah like how hard would that be that would be very hard Wild. you know Wild indeed. How'd they meet? I don't know. I, I, I wish I, I could remember uh, uh, more of that story. I have so story. many questions. I know, I know, I know, I know. But I just had to like end with that because uh, I remember it was, it's a real life contemporary example yeah. that, you know, of course, on an international scale that is just unheard of and yet powerful. And could that kind of friendship, that kind of love could stop wars, you know? Yeah. That's what that could do, yeah. you know? It really could. So, yeah, I think we'll end there. The power of love. It was a wonderful conversation. Thank you so much, Shauna, for joining us on this yeah, uh, on thanks. this episode. Yeah, thank you. Very exciting. And thank you, George, again for, for co-hosting this series with me. I hope we can do it again on our next series, on our next production. Yes, indeed. Yeah. Yes, indeed. This has been Telling the Story, a podcast dedicated to exploring faith, spirituality, arts, and culture, hosted by Ninth Hour Theatre Company, located in Ottawa, Canada. Thank you for joining us for our first podcast series discussing The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe by C.S. Lewis. You can listen again to this and all our podcasts through our website, ninthhour.ca. That's number 9th-hour.ca. The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe is performing live in Ottawa, Canada at the Shankman Arts Centre in the East End, December 14th to 17th, and the Meridian Theatres at Centrepoint in the West End, December 19th to 23rd. For tickets and showtimes, visit our website, follow the links in the description, or go directly to the theatre's website or box office. Most shows sell out, so book your tickets in advance. If you've enjoyed our podcast and want to participate in similar discussions, Please join us live in December for some pre-show discussions before some of the shows. Be sure to follow us and subscribe on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and Instagram. 
Until next time, remember, Aslan is on the move. <laughs>